Well, good morning, Walden Church. Thanks for being here. It's so good to see all of you this Sunday. We are heading back into the story of Joseph and he's free, right? Now he's free, he's out of jail. Not only that, he's got a good job, right? A great job, things are looking up. And while it's great to be out of jail, would you be so quick to forgive the people who put you in jail, right? I mean, Potiphar and his wife falsely accused him and he rotted away in jail for over 10 years. In, in fact, he wouldn't even be in this mess if it weren't for his brothers. Someone has done you wrong. And, and, and it's not just the idiot who cuts you off or who took your parking space on your way to church. No, something happened and the cut runs deep. They betrayed you. They hurt you. And even now, even though it's been months, years, you can't let it go. This is called having a grudge. Something happened to us in the past and we retell it to ourselves over and over. It's actually a form of trauma that you subject yourself to. Eh, but what does it hurt? It can hurt. One time researchers did a test. They did a physical fitness test with two different groups of athletes. One group of athletes were asked to recall a time where they forgave someone, and then they were asked to run through an obstacle course. And the second group was asked to recall a grudge that they held for someone who wronged them, and then asked to run the same course. Which test group do you think ran the course better? Today, Joseph is gonna stare his past square in the face, and we're gonna see what he chooses. Genesis 41 says, the seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was a famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says to you do. So when the famine had begun to spread over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. As we pick up the story, remember a worldwide famine has struck Egypt, just as Joseph had predicted in the dream that Pharaoh experienced. So the situation is bleak. There is no food and people are starving. The Bible says that it's happening all over the world. The only country that seems to have any food or who prepared for this was Egypt because God was with Joseph. Now, we haven't checked in with Joseph's dad and his brothers in a while, so we're going to quickly see what they are doing. Genesis 42 says, When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there, that we may live and not die. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. For the past couple of weeks, we've been saying that God is always working, right? God is always at work, even if we can't see him, sometimes in our life, sometimes in the life of others, sometimes behind the scenes. Clearly, things are starting to shake up back at Joseph's old house. Something is about to go down. Verse six says, now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him 
with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Well, 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 what do we have here, right? I can't help but feel nostalgic with a tiny hinge of irony that when Joseph told them as a teenager, I had a dream that one day you would bow down to me. He wasn't wrong, right? The Bible says Joseph recognized them, and I wonder what that was like for him, what emotions he was feeling, because clearly he holds all the cards right now. He is in charge. So what is he going to do? Verse 9 says, And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said to him, No, my lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. Okay, this is not where I thought it would go. But clearly he knows his brothers and they don't recognize him. So he's going to play a little game. But wait, why don't they recognize him? Well, for one, Joseph was a teenager when all of this happened to the 10 of them. Joseph being the youngest, his appearance would have changed the most. Second, his brothers had no reason to even believe that he was still alive, especially not alive and in charge of Egypt. So they're not looking for him. They're certainly not expecting to see him. Verse 12, he said to them, no, it's the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies." And he put them all together in custody for three days. Okay, joke or not, Joseph is making them sweat a little bit. Bitter, grudge or not, Joseph puts them all in jail for three days. What's going on? I think Joseph is trying to buy himself a little bit of time. He had no idea that his family would come back into his life. He's trying to figure out what to do. Plus, there are some family members whom he loves that he wants to see, namely his father and his full brother, Benjamin. Verse 18 says, On the third day Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go, and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me. So your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in a sack and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Wow. Wow. You see two really big things happening right here. First is the weight and the responsibility these brothers feel for what they did to Joseph. You know, they say, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. 
This is why this distress has come upon us. The Bible never tells us that Joseph begged for his life and that his brothers in that moment hear this heart-wrenching cry as, what, strangers haul your family member away from you? And, and, and they do this knowing that it's their fault? And Reuben says, this is the reckoning for his blood. In other words, it's the price they have to pay. That This is all now caught up with them. It's been 20 years since they'd seen Joseph and done this terrible thing to him. But for these brothers, it feels like yesterday. Have you ever heard that phrase, time heals all wounds? It's a lie, right? I mean, think back to any past hurt, a past wrong, or a death. It's been a while. Some years have passed. Are you healed? No, of course not. You might be okay. You might be able to live with it. You may even have spoke to someone about it, work through it. You're able to deal with it, cope with it now, but you're never healed. These brothers have probably never processed their pain, perhaps never spoken to each other about it. And the guilt of it all, the weight of it all, begins flooding back to them. And the second thing we see is this little bit of Joseph's response. He gives them the food that they asked for, but he also gives them their money back. Now, why would he do that? Verse 26 says that they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of the sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this, their hearts failed them and they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? You know that feeling you get when you slip on a, an old jacket or an old pair of jeans and you reach in a pocket and you find $10, right? And, and you're happy. You're happy to see old money found again. You're happy to get the receipt and say, oh, it wasn't as much as I thought it was gonna be. Not these brothers. They are not glad to see their money. In fact, the Bible says that they are scared to death. And Notice it's not Egypt that they suspect. It's who? God. God is always at work. God is at work right now. God is performing surgery in these men's lives. The, the scars they have, the wounds they have. They thought they were forgotten. They thought they were closed. God begins going back in there and bringing some light. Remember, they still don't know that Joseph is behind all of this. And obviously they have unresolved fear and guilt and stress. And right now, all those buttons are being pushed. They feel enormous pangs of guilt and they think this is punishment. They think this is revenge from God for their past because that's the world that we live in. Action, reaction. You hit me, I hit you back. Well, actually, I don't hit you back. Uh, I actually hit you back harder than you hit me. I hit you back stronger than you hit me. Whatever happens to me, I then take it up a notch, or two, or three. We elevate things. We escalate things. It's called revenge, and revenge is never equal. Revenge is always louder. It's always bigger. It's always stronger. And right now these brothers feel that what is happening to them is the end result of God's revenge on them for their past. And they think that because it's exactly the kind of thing that they would do. It's exactly the kind of thing they did do. You see, in keeping with Joseph's story, and you and I following his plot, we actually skipped a story. 
We skipped an entire chapter in Genesis. We went from Joseph being sold into slavery to Joseph working in Potiphar's house. But there's a story that falls in between those two, and it's Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34 is rarely preached on in church. And I would be surprised if you even knew the story because it's a story about Joseph's sister, Dinah, and how she was raped. And it's a story of revenge. Genesis 34 verse one says, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get this girl for my wife. Now, at first glance, this might seem fair, positive. Uh, it's a good thing to propose. Remember, women back then didn't have the same rights that they have today, and they weren't looked upon as equals in many cultures back then. Shechem sees that he did something shameful, and so he proposes then to turn it around, to make it positive, to give it a positive outcome. And this is actually a law. This is the command from Moses. In the law, he's actually doing what the law is telling him to do. But there is also Dinah to consider. The Bible says she has been humiliated. She has been violated. And just because Shechem falls in love with her after the fact does not make the act right. In fact, the Bible never says that he feels remorse for what he did, only that he wants to turn it around and make it legal by marrying her. In fact, the law only stipulates that he pay the bride price. If he pays the bride price to her father, uh, according to the law, he's off the hook, but he is taking it a step further and saying that he wants to marry her legally. Verse five says, now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with the livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field. All right, I don't know what you think is going to happen next, but when you're a young woman and you have 10 older brothers, uh, do I need to put their face back up on the screen for you? Let's put them back up there. These are hard men, right? This is a biker gang. These guys all have beards. You're gonna tell these men that their little sister was raped. These men who just sold their younger brother into slavery just because he had a big mouth. You're gonna tell these men. All right. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Make your daughters for ourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, and get property out of it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I will give whatever you say to me, only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. So 
Shechem pleads his case. He faces her brothers like a man. He still doesn't apologize or offer any sort of repentance for what he's done, but he offers them financial restitution. He repeats again that he wants to make an honest woman of her, marry her, make it legal. But verse 13 says that Dinah's brothers answer him deceitfully. That's uh, Bible talk for lie, right? They're going to lie. They're going to put their arm around him, laugh, pat him on the back, walk him out of the tent and say, sure, buddy. Yeah. Hey, whatever you say. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Hey, only just one more thing. If you're going to be part of our family, then you need to be part of the family. Oh, yeah, any, anything, Shechem says. Is this something like a, a ritual tattoo or a hazing? Uh, it's a little more painful than a tattoo. Uh, we want everybody in your tribe to be circumcised. Pastor David, I don't understand why we don't preach this story more in church. Verse 18 says, Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son, Shechem, and the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of this city. So all the men of the tribe agree to these terms. And did you notice why? Financial gain, right? They said in verse 23, will not their livestock and their property and their beasts be ours? This is doubly great. You get a wife and then we get this huge inheritance from their people. Look at this. I mean, do you see how this story is playing out? There are two sides. There are two groups of people, right? And, and we have this thing that has happened. We have this incident that has happened between these two groups of people. But the two groups of people don't see the incident as being the same. The Shechemites are looking at this as it's a delicate problem. Right? And we have to be careful with this. It's a bad thing, yes, but it's not a huge deal. And we're doing our diligence, we're paying a fee, and we're going to make a few agreements. And hopefully, in a couple more days, we'll be able to sweep all of this under the rug. It'll be behind us. It was a misunderstanding, but now it looks like things are working out. It's going to be beneficial to everyone. For Jacob and his family, the Bible says, the men were indignant, very angry, because he had done an outrageous thing. None of those are good words. None of those are happy words. Clearly, these two groups, they are not on the same page. And what makes it worse is Shechem's family is nobility. Verse 2 says he's the prince of the land which means this is a family that is used to being a part of a system of power, used to getting what they want. Shechem proves that by taking Dinah and forcefully being with her. Jacob's family is also wealthy, that is true. But they are nomad shepherds, right? So on a micro scale, this is one family hurting another family, one person hurting another person, but on a macro scale, it's a broken system of those people who are in power continuing to use their power to take what they want, do whatever they want. And the lesser people, we just throw money at them and we hope the situation goes away. 
and there's still no apology. There's still no repentance. There's simply an arrogant man and his father who think they can buy anything and do anything that they want. Spoiler alert, this isn't going to end well. Verse 25 says, On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. This is what revenge looks like. It's bigger, it's bloodier. This is what happens when things escalate. This is what revenge looks like. It's an incident between two people, and it turns out to become a war between two people groups, and the end result was murder. The end result was genocide. They killed all the men. They left widows and orphans and then took them for themselves, and they claimed all their property. Why don't we preach this story in church? Because the entire story is an embarrassment. There's no heroes. There's no positive role models. Why is this story even in the Bible? Is it just an example of what not to do? Well, let's consider this story with Dinah and hopefully find a way to bring it back around to Joseph and how Joseph is now going to treat his brothers. Because now the roles are reversed. He has all the power. He can teach his brothers a lesson. Or, right, or he can enact horrible revenge on them. It's left versus right. Call it that. Call it north versus south. Call it blue versus red. Call it team A versus team B. You could even say it's Christian versus non-Christian, whatever you want. There's always going to be a team versus another team. There's always going to be your side versus our side. You're either on our team or you're not. You're either, you're either with us or against us. In the Dina story, team A says, what's the big deal? It's just sex. You know, what people do with their own bodies in their own home is their own business. What's the big deal? Drugs don't hurt anybody, just the user. What's the big deal? It's just a fight between two boys. Boys will be boys. They'll get over it. What's the big deal about who wants to have relationships with whom or who wants to marry whom? Or what's the big deal about religion? What does it matter if you believe in that God and somebody believes something else or for that matter if they believe in any God at all? As long as we aren't hurting anybody, what does it matter? Just like in the Dinah story, one team typically says, it's not a big deal. And team B says, it's a huge deal. It matters. What we do matters. What we say matters. How we act matters. The laws we enforce, the laws we don't enforce matters. And make no mistake, just like we are seeing right now playing out for us on our television screens, the gap between the teams is only growing wider. You see, the problem with Jacob's sons is that they were not honest. The Bible says they were deceitful. There was collusion. They were not honest with themselves. They were not honest with their enemy. Team A did not take ownership of their mistake. They did not apologize. They did not offer any emotional healing. But team B was not honest about how much they were hurt. And instead of trying to create peace, instead of trying to find a solution, they escalated 
to war. So which side was right? Neither side. All right, all right. But which side was more right? Neither side. There's no winners here. There's no heroes. This is a horrible, terrible story. It has a horrible, terrible outcome. Revenge is horrible. You know, seeing Joseph's brothers now, and they are bowing before him, this is the time to kick them, right? This is the time to rub it in their face. This is the time to say, I told you so. And when Joseph has them thrown in jail, he should have just left them there. Joseph was in jail for over 10 years. So Joseph's brothers deserve at least, what, 20 to life? How dare they come asking for grain, for a handout? They don't deserve any grain, and they certainly don't deserve any mercy. What does Joseph give them? Each receives a full sack of grain and their money returned. Joseph didn't have a grudge. Out of all the people that could have replayed the last 20 years or so in their mind over and over again, it was Joseph. All 10 of these brothers should have been on Joseph's hit list. Only thing is, Joseph didn't have a list. Who's on your list? You know, when you keep a list, it's a list of bitterness. And all the joy gets squeezed out. And the Bible refers to this as someone who has a hardened heart. And when you have a hardened heart, your heart becomes insensitive. Proverbs 28 says, whoever conceals his transgression, yeah, just like, just like his brothers, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Often when there's two groups and they choose sides, there is a common thing in both. They each have a hardened heart. There's stubbornness. You know, neither side is willing to admit wrong. Neither side is willing to apologize. Neither side is willing to negotiate. When hearts are hard, we just cast more blame and we throw out more excuses. Proverbs says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord. In the weeks coming up, we're going to see Joseph's heart. And we're going to see that his heart is softened. But let's close out today by looking at some benefits of that. The benefits of having a softened heart. First, a soft heart places people over things. Joseph could have held back the grain, or he could have charged, that, charged them more, right? Cheated them. But rather, he gives both things back. Ultimately, Joseph wants his brothers, and he wants his father restored to him. He knows that things like grain and money are stupid compared to the real, authentic lives of people in his life. Joseph knows that relationships matter more than stuff. Second, a soft heart is full of grace. A hard heart is full of grudges and vengeance, and you're cooking up a scheme. You know, you see your brothers and you're hatching a plan, and you're going to dole out some sort of revenge plan, or at least dole out equal punishment. 
Joseph seems only interested in forgetting the past. He seems to be starting something new with them. A soft heart is generous. Joseph had learned that lesson when God showed it to him. When Joseph gets out of jail, he doesn't just get freedom. He gets a new wardrobe, he gets jewelry, he gets a new chariot, he gets a credit card with no limit, and he gets a wife. Plus, he gets the best job in the country. God shows him unmerited favor, unmerited grace. 1 Peter 4 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Joseph doesn't just give his brothers back food. He gives them all their money back as well. And lastly, a soft heart fights for the justice and mercy of others. You know, through all of this, Joseph's goal is for the restoration and the healing of all people. In the scriptures, Joseph has stored up the wealth of Egypt and all its food, and yet the verses say people come from all over the world. Egypt doesn't owe the world its food or its resources, but we don't see Egypt sending these people away. In a sermon that Martin Luther King gave, he said that we should be tough-skinned but tender-hearted Christians. But in my experience, I think I'm the opposite. How often am I a thin-skinned and super-sensitive person about what people say about me, but then I'm tough-hearted in my dealing with them. I study somebody else's predicament to the nth degree, but I don't do one thing to actually help them. Or worse, I put expectations on them that I would never even be able to meet myself. John writes of Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible tells us Jesus is full of grace and truth. And believe me, I know, I know how difficult it is to be both. But when it's just truth, and we just uphold truth without grace, that is when we end up being hard hearted. C.S. Lewis said, he, he made it very simple. I think he, he said it and he made it so much simpler. He said, God wants a child's heart and a grown-up's head. Can we do that? Joseph has every reason to hate his brothers, every reason to take revenge, every reason to analyze all the ways in which his brothers were wrong, and then cross his arms and say, I don't owe you anything, and I will do nothing to help you. And if he wanted to, he could hurt them. Instead, he shows grace upon grace. He has a grown-up's body, but a child's heart. And at the end of it all, he doesn't want revenge. He just wants his brothers back. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I don't know why we call this the Old Testament. Because this message is so fresh and so relevant to us right now. Lord, I just pray for the heart and mind of each one who's heard these words, that we might remember that our role as your disciple is to be like you. And that we need to find a way to be people who are full of truth and grace, to be soft-hearted people, 
to be people that looks out for and provides for, to be people that love, to be people whose first thought isn't to take revenge or to get back at or to hurt, even if we've been hurt. We think of our own Savior on the cross, nailed to it and beaten, and his only act was to forgive the ones who put him there. It is such a hard thing to do. And I know, we're all stir-crazy right now. We're all a little bit extra grumpy, all a little bit extra on edge. It seems even doubly hard to be people of grace, to be people of forgiveness, to be people of mercy. Lord, I just pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would make us daily more like your Son in every way, that you would give us eyes to see, words to speak, hands and feet that do your will, that we would look out for the welfare of our brothers and sisters over our own, and that we would love our neighbor as ourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. As always, don't forget that this is a link on YouTube, and uh, you can also find links to the audio sermon at waldenchurch.com. You can clip and copy those links, and you can post them to your own wall or post them to a friend's wall that you think might benefit from today's message. I love you guys. I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.